nothing like a little comic relief as we get ready to open God's Word. I feel like that's a picture of most of my life, stumbling out the gate, but that's okay. It's not how you start, it's how you finish, right? Okay. Hey, so um, the choir is normally up here, or making their way out, or actually, no, they're making their way in as I come up to preach, so I don't have that buffer that I normally get. Uh, but I'm going to take a moment anyway and just say something that I've, I've actually said many times before, uh, but I want to reinforce that this morning, uh, especially in light of uh, some of the, the topics that I've touched on in recent weeks. I just want to make sure that you all uh, feel welcome uh, any week. Um, if, if you have something on your mind uh, to share with me, some response to something I, I preach on or something I say, uh, you can come to me with that. Um, I'm available, and, and I hope that you would find space with me, a safe place to speak what's on your heart, uh, because I care what's on your heart. So um, this week, next week, any week, my, my office door is open to you. My life is open to you. And uh, if there's something that, that is uh, confusing or troubling or uh, if I'm just out in left field, uh, feel free to come and let's talk about it. I, I'm open to you, okay? Hey, listen, we're going to be in Mark's gospel again today. We're in chapter 10 now. And uh, we're making our way with Jesus. We're following him on his way to the cross. And last week, uh, in the, the, the story before the one we're going to read this morning, um, Mark tells us that Jesus was starting towards Jerusalem. And we made a point about how that signals for us a shift in, in his, not just physical trajectory, but in the trajectory of his ministry. He's, he's been hovering around in the north. He's been, he's been teaching. He's been healing. He's been uh, preaching and doing all those things leading up to this, this shift where he turns his attention, he turns his mind, he turns his face towards Jerusalem and the cross. So that was last week. This week, Mark says he's not just starting, he's now on the way. So he's, he's launched out. He's, he's responded to the, 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 the rich young ruler, and now he's ready to, to confront his disciples. So let's take our Bibles and turn to chapter 10. I'm going to be reading from verses 32 through 45. Mark says, they were now on the way up to Jerusalem. Now, real quick, in case you didn't know, Mark is not talking about north. All right, I'm from the north. When I say, let's go up there, I am always talking about somewhere north of where I am. That's just how we northerners, we Midwesterners, whatever I am, that's how we talk. Now, I get it. In the south, it's different. Everywhere is up in the south. Um, But for Mark, up is is as much in elevation as it is. It's actually elevation alone. It's not direction. So don't get hung up in the fact that Jesus is actually traveling south at this point. He's going up to Jerusalem, okay? On his way up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe. And the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request? He asked. They replied, When you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, You don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. 
And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now Mark has set the scene for us here. Jesus has started out, he's now on his way up to Jerusalem. But I I don't know if you noticed immediately there in that first verse that I read that that there's a distance that has been created between Jesus and his disciples. Mark tells us Jesus is now out in front. The disciples are starting to lag behind a little bit. And the crowd is even farther back still. And I don't think that separation is meant to just be physical. It's not like when I'm walking with my kids through a parking lot, I have this tendency with my longer strides to take off and and I have to make myself slow down so that they can keep up. I don't think this is Jesus the sprinter who's just faster than everybody. It's more than a physical separation. I think what's going on here is that the purpose of Jesus and the purpose of his disciples, the intentions of Jesus and his disciples, the, the expectations of Jesus and his disciples are not in alignment. You see, Jesus is focused. He's committed to fulfilling his Father's will. That's what occupies his attention. That is what he is laser focused on. His disciples are not. His disciples are focused on something else. We're told that they're filled with awe. The crowd are overwhelmed with fear. And so somehow in this mix of Jesus being committed to his Father's will and the disciples being filled with awe and the crowd being overwhelmed with fear, there's this sense of growing tension, this atmosphere of, of something is about to happen. There's, they're not moving together now. There's, there's a disconnect that has occurred between him and his followers. And so in verse 33, once more again, Jesus begins to explain to them where he's going and what it means. And this is now the third time in Mark's gospel. It's the third time in his, as many chapters where Jesus has explained to them what's going to happen. And each time, he's been that much more clear, that much more specific than the time before. If you were to go back to Mark chapter 8, verse 31, that's the first time Jesus begins to explain what it means that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's what it means for him to be the Son of Man, that he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be betrayed by the religious leader, or he's going to be... Um, He's going to be turned over to the religious leaders. They will kill him and he will die. That's what he said in Mark chapter 8. And then one chapter later, in, in, in chapter 9, verse 31, he, he gets a little bit more specific than before. There's still this idea of him going to Jerusalem and him being turned over to the, the leaders. But this time he uses the word betrayed. He's revealing a little bit more about what's going to happen to him. There's betrayal that lies ahead for him. And then here in chapter 10, Not only is he going to Jerusalem, not only is he going to be turned over, but he's going to be turned over to the Romans. And they're going to mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. So the closer Jesus gets, the more more things are becoming clear. He wants his, his followers to be crystal clear on what's happening. He wants them to be focused on what's going to take place in his life and ultimately in their lives. And despite their differences, he's seeing things one way, they're seeing things another way. They are in agreement on at least one thing, that in Jesus' future is a confrontation with Rome. (laughs) They're definitely in agreement there. And that just amps up the tension that much more significantly in the text. But you know what I discovered as I was looking at this? Not only is the mission of Jesus becoming more clear the closer he gets to the cross, so too is the condition of his disciples' hearts. They become even more brazen than they've been so far in explaining what their desires are, explaining what their intentions, what their expectations are. With each prediction in 8, 9, and 10, where Jesus talked about his suffering and death, the disciples had a different response. The first response was pretty brazen. It was Peter saying, no way. He rebukes Jesus. There's no way that's going to happen to you. You shouldn't have even said that, and I rebuke you in your name. (laughs) Get it? In Jesus' name. Uh, You're not going to do that. That's not going to happen. In chapter 9, their response is, is, it's still ridiculous, but it's a different kind of ridiculous. In chapter 9, now you see them beginning to have questions like, what on earth is he talking about? And they're starting to be filled with fear and uncertainty, and they're talking, kind of whispering behind the scenes, what's going on? But here in chapter 10, their response is, hey, when you go and take that throne from Rome, Put us on your right and your left. We want to be 
in you, we want to share in your glory. It's a pretty brazen request. Now, if you were to look at this story in Matthew, you would see that it was Mama Zebedee who was doing the asking. Don't you love mamas, how they, want, they always want what's best for their sons? I think if, if I was one of Jesus' disciples, I'm pretty sure Candy Scribner would be right there saying, hey, put Sean on the right or the left. Um, or put him on your lap. Put him somewhere. Put him close. M- mamas always want what's best for their boys. So Mama Zebedee is on the case. She's there in Matthew. She's trying to, to make things happen for James and John. Luke just omits the story altogether. I wonder if Mama Zebedee just paid Luke off so he wouldn't include this story later. I don't know. But he, he just omits this whole embarrassing story altogether. But the point is, as Jesus approaches the cross, his mission, his identity, his purpose, who he is, is becoming more clear. And so, too, is the condition of his disciples' hearts. Before Mark, before Mark 10, back in chapter 9, they're arguing it amongst themselves, but now they're asking directly. The greater the pressure, the more that is at stake, the closer they get, the more the twelve settle into the discussion of their own greatness, their own position. Jesus' conception of his future is in stark contrast with his disciples. They could not be farther from one another right now. Jesus is out in front, not just physically. There is a disconnect between him and his followers about what he is all about. They're picturing courts and thrones, and Jesus says, No, I don't have a court and a throne in my immediate future. I have a cup and a baptism. Very different than what you're picturing. You see, the cup in those days was a symbol of suffering and punishment at the hand of God. All throughout the Old Testament, verse after verse, talking about the cup of the Lord, is talking about a cup of judgment and wrath. Psalm 75, 8 says, For a cup is in the hand of the Lord, and the wine foams. It is well mixed, and he pours out of this. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. That Jesus would be facing this type of suffering at the hands of God, or that the Romans would have any any hand at all in, in measuring out this cup, would have been as far from his disciples as east is from the west. They cannot conceive of this being the situation for Jesus. But that's what he's saying. Over and over and over again, three times now in as many chapters, the words of Jesus are evoking for them and for us The picture, the image of the suffering servant from Isaiah. That famous chapter, Isaiah 53, where Isaiah was talking about how this one would suffer at the hands of God. He would be oppressed and treated harshly, unjustly condemned, led away. That it would be the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. How on earth could it be the Lord's good plan to crush his servant? The answer is in verse 6 of Isaiah 53. All of us, you and me, like sheep, have gone astray. And yet the Lord laid on him, on him, the sins of us all. This suffering servant will bear for sinners what they cannot bear themselves. He will experience the end result of our sin. All of the wrath of God will be poured out onto him. And bef- unless you think the wrath of God is just his anger, you're mistaken. It's not just God being mad about bad stuff. The wrath of God is his personal, righteous, constant hostility to evil. His settled refusal to compromise with it. His resolve instead to destroy it. God is absolutely opposed to evil, and he will destroy it in the end. And his wrath is all of his personal, righteous opposition to evil directed at it and Jesus says that's my cup all of God's wrath will be poured out on me I will be under it Uh, it's like a baptism it'll over overwhelm me this another violent image connected to sorrow and grief as as Jesus is going to submit himself to being forcibly plunged beneath the surface of God's wrath I will be smothered by it Jesus says so that you don't have to The closer Jesus comes to the cross, the more clear it is that this is what he's all about. But you know what else? I think the closer that we come to the cross, 
the more closely we see what we're all about. I've had a recent interest in the last month or so in cameras. Does anybody like cameras in here? Any camera fans? You know what I've learned about cameras? <laughs> Sometimes the lens costs more than the actual camera. Isn't that crazy? I mean, you think you're investing in this camera body and you're spending all this money and it's going to produce great pictures for you and you're going to be real excited. Well, then you find out, well, wait a minute. <laughs> the lens that comes with this thing is kind of junky. I've got to spend twice as much on a good lens. It's kind of like a bait and switch, isn't it? I don't know if that's even the right word. But it's, it's this, they reel you in, they get you sucked in, and then they want to milk you for more money. But the truth is about cameras is no matter how nice a camera you get, no matter how big the sensor and all the, the details about it, no matter how much money you spend on the camera, the camera, le- the camera itself is only as good as the lens. It's true. You have a crummy lens, you're going to get a crummy picture, even on a good camera. And I suspect that what Jesus wants us to think to see this morning is that his cross is like a lens. Do you ever think of the cross that way? That the cross helps us to see clearly? After all, it's, it helps us to see the depths of God's love, right? For God so loved the world, the cross. The cross is the only place on earth where, where wrath and forgiveness and truth and love and grace and justice can all be held together in perfect harmony. Only only at the cross do all these things begin to make sense. It's only at the cross where God can say, I hate sin, but I love the sinner. And he can say it with perfect integrity. The cross is where God says, I will destroy evil forever, but in the process I will be saving persons. By the way, there is no evil apart from persons. It doesn't just exist out there, some thing. It doesn't have some substance. It's like evil is out there, and, but I'm here. No. It's like a, a parasite. It, it, it can only exist as it attaches to us. It's, it's actually the absence of something. It doesn't have its own being. It's, it exists because something is missing. And God says, I want to destroy that, but I'm not going to destroy you. I want to destroy it, but save you. It's amazing. And only, it's only in the cross that that is possible. And even more than some functional thing that, that does some thing in our lives, the cross is a lens that reveals the most ultimate truth of all reality. And that is the glory of God's self-giving love. Jesus prayed in John 17 that they would, we would see his glory. Where are you going to see his glory? Most clearly. Right here. You want to see the glory of God? It's not going to be found in blinding light. It's we find in a cross. That's where you see God most clearly. Who he is, what his heart is all about, what he desires for your life and for mine. But the cross also exposes us. <laughs> our own shallowness, our own self-centeredness, our pride. The cross is called a stumbling block and foolishness. It makes no sense. It's offensive. Because the closer you get, the more that you see yourself for who you really are, the more you become aware of the fact that it is you that should have been on the cross. (laughs) Not him. Me. That's my cross. And the closer I get to that, the more I am confronted with that reality. That was my cross. I belong there, and yet, he was there instead. Oh, how we need the Spirit of God to open our eyes to what it means, not just for Jesus, but for us, that the cross is what it is. That he would use the cross for us to see ourselves clearly through it. The disciples aren't seeing clearly. They lack this lens. When asked if they can bear his cup and his baptism, they said, I love that, I'm going to read verse 39 again, it's short. Oh yes, they replied, we are able. They almost sound eager for it, right? They clearly have no idea what they're signing up for. They have no idea what they're saying. They're picturing a cup of blessing. They're picturing a, a, a baptism as a token of God's renewal. They, they think this is some good thing that Jesus is talking about, that something to enjoy, something that they want to be a part of. And Jesus says, yes, you will be a part of it, but not in the way that you think. You haven't even begun to grasp the whole death and resurrection aspect of discipleship. You have no idea what you're saying here. 
unless you think the other ten have it figured out, they don't either. There in verse 41, Mark makes it clear what was in the hearts of the other ten. They're up, <laughs> he uses the word indignant. I love, there's that word again. We, we, we mentioned it a couple weeks ago. Remember, Jesus was indignant with the disciples for preventing the children from coming to him. It's the same word. But I think it means something very different for Jesus to be indignant for that uh, than for the disciples. The other ten to be indignant with James and John for asking for the special place of honor. Their indignation is more like the Pharisees, the ones who had indignation at the ministry of Jesus. That indignation is that, it's that self-centered feeling you get whenever someone else gets recognition that you don't. You know what I'm talking about. Every one of you knows what I'm talking about. When someone else is being praised, someone else is getting attention, someone else is being, is being honored and you're being left out. That feeling you have, that mixture, that, that cocktail of jealousy and moral outrage, that's indignation. That's actually a very fallen indignation. It's not the indignation of Jesus. It's the indignation of the Pharisees. When someone else is getting what you think you deserve, or when someone else isn't getting what you think that they do deserve, that's also the same kind of feeling. They deserve that, and yet they don't get it. That's outra- outrageous. They deserve that. It's that feeling we get when someone isn't doing something the way you think it should be done. Anybody guilty of that? <laughs> don't raise your hands. Don't want anybody to encrypt. The truth is, all of us should raise our hands. Every one of us thinks things should be done a certain way, and when someone doesn't do it our way, we get all bent out of shape about it. Indignation. Or it's that feeling you feel when you're doing something that you think someone else should be doing. When you're cleaning up after someone's mess, that, that feeling you feel, you know what I'm talking about. Someone else's mess, you're cleaning it up. They should be here cleaning this up. It's not my mess. Indignation. I'll tell you what, all of us are occupying a crime scene of indignation. This room, you're sitting in Exhibit A, in the courtroom of indignation. Every week when these chairs are stacked, I promise you someone is indignant because they're doing the chairs and someone else is not. I promise you. I promise you. I promise you that the one that or the ones that came in to, to put them out are tempted to feel indignant that they're doing it by themselves. And I know it's true because I'm guilty of it. I, <laughs> I'm the chief of sinners here. I've been in here. I've done chairs by myself. And that feeling like, they're going it, there should be people in here helping me. <laughs> there, and you know what? That's what we tell ourselves, isn't it, Bonnie? Someone should be in here. The pastor shouldn't stack the chairs. Okay, that's just a lie from the devil. <laughs> now, we're laughing because it makes us feel better about the conviction. I've, I'm, I'm guilty of both. I've stacked chairs and thought someone else should be doing it. And I've not, st- not, stocked ch- not stacked chairs when I should have been. I'm guilty. We're guilty. And maybe you've never even thought about the chairs, but think about something else in your life. The moral outrage that someone did that or didn't do that or they got this and you didn't. Indignation. What's Jesus' response to indignation? Well, he rebukes them. It prompts a very strong response there in verses 42 through 45. You want to talk about getting what you don't deserve? (laughs) Or not getting what you do? Jesus says, I'm going to a cross. You want to talk about indignation? You want to talk about your rights, what you deserve, what you don't deserve? I'm going there for you in your place. And you have the nerve to be upset because they might get some space of honor that you don't? You're completely missing everything. You're focusing on yourselves. You're not thinking and acting like those who belong to my kingdom. You're thinking of those who belong to outside of my kingdom. My kingdom isn't about you getting your way or you getting your rights. It's about you giving yourself away for the sake of another. My kingdom is about love and service and and, and and focus on everything but yourself. And all you can think about is, is your position. And he clarifies for us in verse 45 this, 
perhaps the most insightful verse in the whole book of Mark in understanding Jesus and what he's all about. Even the Son of Man came not to be served. If anyone had any right to be served, it's him. But he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When I was a, well, a freshman for the second time in college. <laughs> so yeah, so I went to college for about a year and a half, dropped out. I would have been kicked out if I didn't drop out. It was, it was, a, it was a rough time in my life. So I re-enrolled. I got my life back together with the Lord. I re-enrolled at Bible college. So I was a freshman for the second time. My second freshman year, <laughs> I started uh, working at a local church as a youth pastor. First time ever having any idea of, of anything like this. It was, I was brand new. My very first Sunday school lesson as a youth pastor, I gave the kids the challenge. I said, I want you to look at Mark and tell me why Jesus came. Pretty ridiculous question, isn't it? And, and for an hour, these poor kids just flipped through. Like, you could see like, they're just ready to give up. I mean, they, what on earth is he at? I, had, I didn't know what I was doing. They didn't know what I was doing. I don't know if God even knew what we were doing. I wanted them to find Mark 10, 45. <laughs> it was my pathetic attempt to, to, to steer them towards a significant verse. Um, so God forgive me for my, my failures as a teacher. But the point is, this verse is significant. This verse is the key, I think, to unlocking the, the reality of what his kingdom is all about. This is how you understand it. And he uses this word ransom. Now, that's, that may not be a word that we use every day in our, our, our everyday vocabulary, although we know of, have friends who named their child Ransom, so they use that word every day, probably many times. I don't use that word every day. Now, these guys would have known exactly what he was talking about. Ransom was a very common, very familiar image to them. This is that price that was paid to liberate a slave, the price that was paid to free a prisoner, that price that was paid to free a condemned person. I guess it would be kind of like if, if we got in our car after church and we drove up to the prison up the road and you went to the warden and you said, Joe Schmo, I'm going to pay the price to set them free. Whatever, whatever their crime, I will, I will take it to myself. I will be responsible for it. I will pay the fee, pay the, pay the ransom, and as a result, that person's slate is wiped clean. That's called redemption, by the way. That's the connection of ransom to redemption. The payment and the result. 1 Peter 1, 8, 1, 18 and 19 says, God paid a ransom to save you. He paid the price for your sin. All of it. And it was paid with the blood of Jesus. That's a pretty, that's a pretty amazing transaction, isn't it? That all of your stuff, all of your sins, your indignation paid for once and for all he doesn't have to he doesn't have to be crucified over and over again he's paid the price so that you can be redeemed it's amazing and while these guys are caught up in their concern for position and place and power jesus says the mark of belonging to my kingdom is the cross where you give yourself away for another. You take into your life their stuff, that they could be redeemed, that they could be forgiven, that they could experience life. You bear what others can't bear for them. That's my kingdom, Jesus says. You're worried about you. In my kingdom, you worry about others. And he shows them with this, this ransom language just how far he's willing to go to be touched by our sins, by, by the penalty of our sins, by our fate, but not for his sake, but for ours. And this is the type of life that characterizes his kingdom in any who desire to follow him. Now, it amazes us, doesn't it, that these guys don't seem to get it. <laughs> it amazes us when we, we read these. I mean, how much more clear could Jesus be? He's talking about going to Jerusalem and suffering. I mean, he said it crystal clear there in verse Verses 33 and 34, I'm going to be betrayed but to the leading priest. By the way, in chapter 9, after Jesus says he's going to be betrayed, I think that's the reason they're kind of, la they're kind of scared to, to question him. 
because they understand that betrayal means, oh my goodness, that might be one of us. But surely they can't be one of us, right? There's no way I would betray him. We hear this later in the upper room. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be handed over. They'll, they're going to sentence me to die. I'm going to be handed over to the Romans. They're going to mock, spit, flog, kill, and then I'm going to rise again. He couldn't be more clear. And yet these guys don't get it. And we look at that and we say, how can you not get that? It, it amazes us. I mean, we all know what discipleship is. We know that it's this self-denying, self-risking, self-giving of ourselves for the redemption of the world and following Jesus. And we're not as brazen in our methods as these guys and asking, well, I hope you're not, and asking God to give you a place of honor. But I'll tell you something. Be careful in your walk with God that you don't expect a crossless salvation. Be careful in your walk with God that you don't seek out a painless existence. As though walking with God is just a matter of receiving all of the benefits without any of the skin in the game. We follow Jesus for the comfort, what he can do for me, what he can do for us. It's that, that glory without any cost. And usually when that's our mentality, we end up doing exactly what they did. And we jockey with each other for position and power, even in church. I want my way. There's no cross for me, it's just for Jesus. I benefit from Jesus' cross so that I can be superior to you. That's how we end up living. We, we throw elbows at each other. We talk about each other. We, we jockey for position. By our subtle behaviors, we demonstrate just how little we grasp what it means to be the disciples of a crucified Lord who calls us to join him in his self-giving for the sake of another. I've been reading over the last month or so, maybe two months, the, uh, the daily text that comes from Asbury's seedbed. Uh, J.D. Walt is the name of the guy who writes them. I don't know if you've had a chance to read those. I know Pastor Alden does and several others um, it's really a great resource. It's delivered uh, by email to your inbox every day of the week. And it's just a, a meditation on a, a few verses of Scripture. It's a little bit of commentary. It's, and I'll tell you, there's some really great stuff there, and it's been feeding and nourishing me. And uh, he's working through Ephesians and, uh, right now, and so he's kind of working verse by verse through the book. And a couple, couple of uh, days, maybe even a week or so ago, he wrote on the need for us as the church to experience what he calls the second half of the gospel. Now, what on earth is he talking about there? Well, he's reading from uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2, where Paul writes about the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. Now, Walt confesses, he says, that he tends to always view God's grace as something that God gives to me and for me. Right? That's how we view God's grace. God's grace, God's gift to me. It's for me. And you know what? There's, there's truth to that. God does give his grace to us. He does offer grace for us. But this is only the first half of the gospel. It's not the whole gospel. He writes this phrase, the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you is all about the second half of the gospel. And he goes on to flesh out that distinction between the first and the second half. And he says this, the first half is, is described by justification, what God has done for you. But the second half is, is more about sanctification, what God wants to do in you. The first half is, is the new birth, but the second half is that growth in grace, that you're, you're a newborn baby, but you grow and you mature. It's, the, it's, it's what the first half is all about, that you would become the second half. The first half is, is summed up in John 3.16, for God so loved all the world that he gave his only begotten son. But the second half is about 1 John 3.16, where, where John says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave his life up for us, so we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's real love, by the way, what's printed on our sign. Real love, giving our lives away for the sake of others. That first half is when we say, Lord Jesus, take me out of Egypt. Free me from Egypt. But that second half is where we say, Jesus, take Egypt out of me. <laughs> take me out of Egypt, but now take Egypt out of me. Let me enter your kingdom. Lord, put your kingdom in me. The first half says, I am loved by God. I am saved by grace. But the second is, I am becoming the love of God. I'm becoming a vessel of his grace. God, give me grace for the sake of myself. 
God, give me grace for the sake of others. You see, this is what it means to experience the second half of the gospel. To become a steward of God's grace, not a sponge. He doesn't give us grace so we can hoard it to ourselves, but that it can be pressed out of us for the sake of another. And Jesus promised those who follow him, you will drink my cup. You will be pressed. You will, be, you will take into yourself, not necessarily God's wrath, but you'll take into yourself, you will embody the, the, the stuff of other people's lives, like I do. Following Jesus means being touched like Jesus is touched. And the question for me and for you this morning is, are we willing to die to ourselves that another might live? It's a fundamental principle in all of God's creation, is that in order for something to live, something must die. Are we willing to be those people who will die to ourselves that another might live? That's how God is, God is saying this is how the world will be saved. This is how evil will be, will be dealt with. Yes, Jesus says, I take it into myself, and, and I'll die and I'll rise again. But guess what else? I want to lead you to a place where you die to yourselves, where the evil that, it's, that is in you is extinguished, one person at a time. The one who is self-giving love was touched by our sin so that we who are sinful might be touched by his self-giving love. And not just recipients, not sponges, but conduits, conduits of his grace. All that he gives, we turn back out to others. There are two grand moments in the, the Christian calendar. The first is from Advent to Epiphany, which we just observed a couple of months ago. And the other is the one we find ourselves in right now, from Lent to Pentecost. The first celebrates that movement from darkness to light. And the second celebrates that movement from death to life. Both movements begin with a descent and end with an ascent. And the summit of both, the apex, is the lowest place. Do you realize that? The, the, the summit of Advent to Epiphany is a manger, the lowest place possible. The summit of the movement from Pentecost to, I'm sorry, from Lent to Pentecost is a cross. And that's because in God's economy, the lowest place is the highest place. That's how his kingdom works. And that journey that we take from to the manger and that journey we take that we're on right now to the cross is designed to locate us by disorienting us. It flips everything upside down. It causes everything to be turned around, flipped inside out. And we're only ever able to find out who we really are and what life is all about when we allow ourselves to be lost in him. He wants to locate us by disorienting us. And only when we follow Jesus, orient all of our lives around him. Look at the world. Look at Jesus. Look at ourselves through the lens of his cross. Only then does everything begin to make any sense. He wants to produce in our lives a seamless connection between the first half of the gospel and the second half. Grace in me, grace for me, to grace through me, grace for others. He wants to make us a people who, like him, give their lives away for the sake of the world. That's our challenge this morning, to give our lives for the, away for the sake of the world. I'm going to invite Jeff up. He's going to close us in a song. Every song has been appropriate this morning. I think this one will be maybe even the most appropriate. I thank the Lord for guiding Jeff week after week to, to prepare music that, that so aligns with the truth of his word. Uh, it's just amazing to me. And Jeff is going to lead us here, and I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand. You know the routine. You're, you're welcome at any point to come and pray, to, to come and speak to the Lord, to ask him, Lord, how am I supposed to respond to the truth of your word? How, am, how do I need to die to me? Where do I have areas of indignation or self-centeredness? Where am I focused on, on my position, my place, the gratification of my desires that are not in alignment with yours? I beg you, I beg you, if you're starting to fall behind Jesus in your walk through life, don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. You can close the distance this morning. 
And it may only be as far as the, from the first row to, the, to this kneeling place right here. Close the distance between you and Jesus right now as Jeff closes us in a song. I'll pray, Lord, thank you for this morning, this time of worship. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us a picture of your heart, and it's in the shape of a cross. Lord, may that picture define my heart, our heart. And for those this morning who want that to be true for their lives, may they find this altar, this kneeling place, a place of connection with you. Letting you have your way with us. We want to die to ourselves so that another might live. We thank you, Lord, and we trust what you're going to do in these remaining moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Come now as Jeff closes us in song.